Hi, my name is Ryan Thielen. I uh, work for Procore Technologies here. I wanted to give you a brief snapshot of what a job site looks like and how the various tools in Procore uh, are applied on that job site and why we even have them in the first place. Uh, so to start with, if you were to build anything, say this building, uh, we have somebody out there who's going to be an owner. Um, they are going to go out and they're going to find some fundraising. Um, they're going to find the location for the site and uh, they're probably going to go out and find your engineer and architect as well and uh, sometimes even the contractor as you'll see as we get into this a little bit. Uh, so you always have an owner uh, and it can be a person, it could be a company, it could be a, a semblance of people. Uh, an owner is just representing a role. Um, off of that they're going to go find engineer or architect to design this building uh, and figure out what this building is going to look like, what its purpose, how it's going to work. Uh, to give a brief snapshot of what the difference is between an architect and an engineer, um, the engineer really handles the technical design behind a building. So the engineer figures out what size those foundations need to be, what the strength needs to be in that concrete, the technical details behind the building. That's what an engineer does. Uh, the architect really is more responsible for the design of the building. So what's it going to look like? Where are the windows going to be? Uh, where are we going to put that table? Uh, more the design layout. Often if there is an architect involved, they also act as the primary contact for that engineering team uh, and as the lead. So, uh, And it's not even uncommon for them to represent the owner in the job site and take that lead role. So architects definitely have their own part. Um, and then thirdly, we have the contractor. And that contractor, uh, again, is going to ultimately be responsible for building that uh, facility and managing all the subcontractors and people that are on site constructing the building. Uh, all these different lines that I'm making here, and I'm going to erase this one right here, we'll just have it go that way, um, represent contracts. And so in terms of Procore, uh, here would be our prime contract. Um, now it's important to note that these three roles exist on every single project, but they don't always necessarily uh, involve just as I described it. So I used to work for a design build firm, and for design build we actually did both the engineering and the construction, so we actually fulfilled both of these roles right here. Um, we even built a, an airport in my former town, and when we built the airport, the owner was the owner of our company, and so in that case we fulfilled all three roles on the job site. But nonetheless, all three roles were there. All three roles exist. So I'm going to go ahead and redraw that just so that it's a little bit more clear. And like I said, it doesn't really matter where we go. It can come off the engineer architect as leading the contractor or the owner. Um, for the purposes of this today, we're going to go off the uh, owner. So here's our contractor. <clears throat> and like I said, all these lines represent contracts. Uh, that contractor, in turn, will come down and handle the subcontractors and the vendor. Uh, and again, all these lines represent contracts. So in Procore terms, this would be our prime contract, uh, this would be our subcontract, and this would be our purchase order appeal. Uh, together, subcontracts and purchase orders in Procore, we call them commitments. Uh, they're really representing the cost side of the equation. As far as Procore is concerned, uh, this is what we treat as the prime contract, uh, our subcontract, and our purchase order. Um, and together, subcontracts, purchase orders, uh, we call them commitments. They go in the commitments area of Procore. Um, and really represent the cost side of the equation. So when we're talking about the budget tool in Procore, that's what we're looking at. This would be our costs. Uh, this would be our initial budget. So, all right, so you have all these parties involved. The next question is, why would you even bother having subcontractors or vendors in the first place? Uh, and there's several reasons for that. Um, one of the biggest reasons is just simply the cost of doing the work on site. So, if you have a large contractor, and we're in Santa Barbara here, uh, if we had a large contractor from, say, Los Angeles come up and do the work and build this building, um, that would cost them a lot of money to have their contractors, their people, their builders to come up here and live here, work here, eat here, uh, cost them a lot of money. And it may be cheaper for them to just hire locals to come do the work. Uh, secondly is licensing. Uh, and uh, we have all sorts of licensing and every part of the job site may have licensing from the general contract license uh, to the electrician license. And those licensing can be at any level. So it can be the state level, 
uh, you may need a, a state electrical license. It could be at the uh, county level, at the city level even, to have those licensing. And we do that for a few reasons. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, to be honest, is just so everybody gets a cut of the pie. Uh, that city wants a little bit of the piece. Uh, another reason is to force you to use local contractors or to drive that local contractor. It's not advantageous or something that Santa Barbara would want to have happen is to have a large contractor come up from LAX to do the work. Uh, or from come up from. It's not advantageous for Santa Barbara area to have a large company from Los Angeles come up and do the work. They'd much rather keep it local, and licensing is one way to force that. Um, and thirdly is just simply logistics and safety. So I come from the land of Minnesota, and we have really cold weather, and we have frost that goes down six feet, and so you have to be aware of that when you're uh, building buildings and designing buildings. And so licensing helps ensure that the people that are doing it are familiar with the area. Similarly, out here you have seismic that we just don't deal with in Minnesota. Um, so there's multiple reasons to have those um, subcontractors uh, and vendors on site. The big difference between a subcontractor and a vendor, subcontractor performs work. Uh, if you had a plumber come in and install a toilet in your house, he'd be the subcontractor. The Home Depot where he got the toilet is the vendor. Um, they sometimes can be the same. There are times where a subcontractor is supplying the material and installing it, in which case they fulfill both needs. Uh, and there's times where a subcontractor may indeed have their own vendors um, or their own subs uh, on the job site beyond themselves. So the larger the project you go, the more likely that you're going to have that tiered down structure. So onto our tools of Procore and where this fits in with the rest of the stuff, the next area I kind of want to dive is bidding. Uh, not only are every one of these lines a point of a contract, in most cases there's also, there's also a phase of bidding that goes on. So for the case of uh, that owner, when they went out to find that contractor, they went through a bidding cycle where they sent out the drawings and designs or at least a concept of the, what the building's going to be. And then they asked the contractors for a few things. Uh, they're looking for probably some form of a schedule as to how quickly they can do this and what it's going to cost to do it. Uh, and there's really three things that they're looking for. Uh, and it's not always the same for every project, but um, they're looking for how cheap can it be done, uh, how fast can it be done, and what's the quality of work. Uh, and realistically, you have to pick two out of the three. Uh, if it's going to be cheap and fast, it's not going to be well done. Uh, if it's going to be high quality and fast, it's not going to be cheap. And it really depends on what type of project. Um, the more industrial you get, the faster you want that project done and the more you're willing to pay to accelerate that. Uh, if I'm building an ethanol plant, uh, I can start making money as soon as that ethanol plant is done and operational. Uh, and the money that I'd be pulling in from having the plant operational uh, may be more than the cost of having a contractor work 24-7 in order to build the building. And so at that case, it's more advantageous for me to have it fast, even at the expense of uh, having a more expensive project. Um, on the flip side, uh, you know, my home and my, my house, if I was having a residential house built, uh, I may be really after that cheapest uh, level of the house and it may not matter to me as much that it's done quickly, it's more that it's, it's cheap and high quality. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking for and what type of project you have uh, as far as where your, where your priorities lie uh, along those three, those three objects. And, and all of that decision making is going on during the bidding phase of the project or during the bidding phase of any of these contracts. Um, and so we, we figure all that out from a standpoint of what are they looking for and all that gets rolled into a, a schedule. And at the end of the day, the schedule makes or breaks a project. And the larger the project is, the more the schedule holds everything around that project in tracking when they're going to install stuff, how many people are going to be on site, etc. And uh, some reasons as to how a schedule is so powerful, the easiest way to explain it is looking at, you know, if we were to build a building, we could come in, hire 100 people to come and pour all the foundations at the same time, and then send them home for a week while we wait for the concrete to dry, and then bring them back and have them do the slabs, and then send them home and wait until the steel guys get done so they can go to the next floor. But it's not practical for you to actually do that. From a manpower standpoint, to lay off people, pick them back up, it's very expensive, it's time consuming. Um, and it just doesn't necessarily make sense. So instead, you'd want to have a group of six guys come on, start pouring foundations. And as they get to the third foundation and they're a few days in, now behind them come the steel guys and the steel guys put up the, the uh, columns. And then right behind them comes in the electricians and they start running conduit. Um, and, and it can carries on from there. Um, so in other words, when you're looking at a schedule, 
uh, you're tracking not just when things are going to be built, but your manpower on the job site. In a typical schedule, you're going to see a manpower graph like that where you're going to hire on staffing, and as you get going, more and more crews come on site. During the peak part of the project, you may have everybody from plumbers to finishers um, to finish work all going on at the same time. Um, and so you tend to have a bell curve there. Um, and the schedule does many other things as well beyond tracking uh, the manpower on a job site and when things are going to get built. Uh, it also allows them to predict when that's going to be finished. Uh, and it, the bigger the project, the more it matters. If this is a two-year construction project, uh, knowing where your dates are at really matters, uh, especially when you start having things like chillers that may not be able to sit outside in the weather uh, and yet they take a long time to construct. They may be specific for that building. A large commercial building may have a chiller built for that building. Um, and so it may have a three month lead time where it takes them to construct that and deliver it to the job site. And you have to be ready. The floor's gotta be ready for it to come in. And as soon as it's in, you gotta put the roof on so it doesn't get weather on it. Um, so it's really important looking at a schedule and planning all that out. And if something happens uh, early on in a project, it can change when those target dates are. And the earlier you can make you can plan for that, the better. As those guys with that built that chiller may hang on to it, they're not going to hang on to it for free. They're going to charge you every day that they have to hang on to that chiller and can't deliver it. So uh, there's a lot of costs and um, planning that goes into a schedule, um, right down even to the quantities of material that's getting input onto the project. Um, and Procore actually doesn't technically do scheduling. We integrate in with the scheduling leaders in, in the industry, which is really Microsoft Project and Primavera P6. Um, both of which integrate very well with Procore. Um, the biggest problem with having a schedule on a job site is sharing it. Uh, schedules are large files, they're unique expensive software and so uh, everybody needs to be aware of when things are happening, what's going on on a project, but um, sharing something like a Microsoft project file is a pain. Either A, you're printing out PDFs and emailing those around, which are large files that don't always go, and they're never up to date. So if I printed it out and sent it today, by tomorrow morning that schedule's out of date. Um, and secondly, for something like P6, where it may be a network uh, system, now how do you even get that out to an owner without printing it out? Or you're sending out files, like Microsoft Project files, in which case the recipients need to have Microsoft Project to even open it. Um, so Procore solves that need by giving you a place to come in, view the schedule uh, in real time, live, what it is right now, uh, in Gantt chart format, in a weekly format, in a two-week look ahead, um, all those kinds of things right in Procore. All right, so we talked about scheduling, uh, we talked about bidding, we talked about some of the contracts. Uh, the next area that I kind of want to dive is some of the more common tools that Procore has and how those interact. Uh, one of the biggest ones that everybody deals with are RFIs, or requests for information. Uh, and what we're really talking about here is any time that something doesn't go as expected. So we started digging for the foundations on the building and we hit a water main. Nobody knew it was here and now I have water flooding in my hole. Uh, as a contractor, I could simply pour some concrete, cap it and go, well, that's problem solved and move on. If the building falls down two years later, uh, I'm the one that's responsible for that. So uh, you really need a engineer or architect to look at that and give you an answer on what you can do and how to proceed. Uh, if you had a beam, steel beam that came that was short, uh, you could send it back and have them add on the extra steel, send you the correct beam, and they'd probably do it at free, but they're not going to pay for your crew that's going to stand around not with nothing to do for three days. And so you know, we really need to ask, can we just weld on a piece and go? As a contractor, you can't make that decision. You need an engineer to sign off on that. And so we have a request for information. Um, they often start with a subcontractor, but uh, for the purposes of this and our graphs, just to keep it cleaner, we're going to say they came from a contractor because they usually come through the sub to the contractor and then on to the engineer. So, request for information. Uh, and basically we're really asking for approval or for how do we want to proceed on something and looking for an engineer's signature behind that. Uh, Procore handles it great and uh, you don't even have to log in the system, you can simply reply to emails, it's really easy. RFIs often lead into another tool that Procore also handles and that's change orders. So anytime we talked about that steel beam and how that beam was a little short and we shot back a question to an engineer, can we just weld on a piece and go? Uh, and they say, nope, I can't, I have to send it back to the, uh, back to the steel fabricator to have a, a longer beam put on. Well, well, the two weeks while I'm waiting for that beam to come back, uh, 
my guys are standing around with no work to do. It's holding up people. I have to pay for that. I may have to pay to have a chiller held a little longer and not delivered when I wanted it to be because that steel beam was short. Um, there's costs associated with that. And those often ultimately end up back with the owner and they end up paying for a lot of that, unfortunately. And so we roll those into change orders. So change orders can happen along any one of these contracts, um, even along purchase orders in Procore, as we really handle large purchase orders. Um, there's kind of two types of purchase orders on a job site. There are the, I'm gonna run down to the hardware store and buy a pack of bolts for 20 bucks and cut a PO, uh, which you do hundreds of them on a job site. And there's also the, I'm gonna buy my rebar on the job site and it's $110,000 uh, purchase order. Uh, Procore handles those large purchase orders very, very well. Realistically, in general, uh, Procore handles a lot of different budgeting tools from the aspect of a project manager. Uh, project managers are often held accountable for their project making money, making, uh, making bank and, and succeeding, but often they don't have access to the accounting systems that track that money. Uh, it's kind of a black box that's kept at the corporate office that they don't have access to. They're reliant on reports. Uh, Procore provides enough tools for the project manager to do his job on the job site. So that includes everything from the main contracts to the budgets um, to the subcontracts, the large purchase orders, uh, even payment applications and tracking of retainage. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects on cost management that Procore really helps with. Um, secondly, we have submittals, and that's another huge area of Procore, and it's, um, it's an area that uh, we have a lot of customizability and areas that can suit many different you contractors' needs. Um, but what I'm talking about with the submittal are specifications and getting those approved for whatever gets installed. Uh, and by specifications, we're talking about everything on a project from the concrete mix design to the light that's in the ceiling has a specification. The engineers design that building uh, with a certain light in mind. They have a certain weight that they built it for, a certain amount of wattage, um, the architect wants a certain amount of illumination in the room, um, etc. And so they write up specifications for that light and those go out with the drawings. Um, and they designed it very specific, so it may be 16.5 watts and 12.3 pounds. And that's what the specifications would say for that light. Uh, and that would go out to the vendors then who actually supply the lights. And they don't have a light that has exactly that specifications, but maybe they have a light that weighs a little bit less, gives off a little bit more light and uses less wattage. Is that okay? I don't know, maybe it makes the room too light. Maybe it's blinding then when you're trying to work in the room. Um, so they have to do what's called a submittal. And it usually starts with the vendors uh, and it comes through the contractor, the owner often approves, and so does the engineer architect. Um, so here's our submittal coming through. And you might ask, like, why does everybody else need to approve this? Uh, the contractor often needs to approve for purposes of um, when can it be arrived on site, can it sit outside. Uh, you, know, you usually only have so much lay down room and a lot of things can't sit out in the weather. Uh, even Some things get stolen, some things just can't sit in rain. Uh, so the contractor often wants to have involvement. Um, the owner wants to have involvement as well. We were talking about that light. A chandelier may fit the specifications for what they need. It may be the right weight, give off the right amount of light, and use the right wattage. Um, but it may look ugly. So the owner may have a buy-in on what that's actually going to be. So it's not uncommon for owners to be involved with the middle approval process. Uh, and of course our engineer and architects. And often multiple facets of that engineer architect firm need to be involved. For that light, uh, the electrical team may need to review that for the wattage and for what that light is doing. The architect may need to look at it to verify that it fits the space and looks nice in the area. Um, the structural engineer may need to review it to determine that the weight is okay. Um, there's a lot of different uh, people and parts that need to approve those submittals. Uh, so Procore handles that very well. Um, so moving on towards the end of a project or even a phase of a project, uh, we're going to do things that's what's called a punch list. Um, Procore handles this great using a mobile tablet even to walk around and do punch list. But what we're really talking about is a checklist and everybody does it whether they write it down or not. Everybody does a punch list. Um, that plumber that installed your toilet, when he gets done he stands up and he hikes up his pants and he looks around and he goes I gotta tighten that bolt, I gotta clean up that and I gotta get my tools out of here. That's a punch list. Um, and multiple different people may do that. That plumber, you're going to walk in after that plumber walks out, and you're going to look around, and you're going to go, he needs to clean that up, he's got to patch that little paint that he scraped, etc. You're doing a punch list. You may not write it down, but that's what it is. Uh, the, larger the, contract, or the larger the project, 
the more phases and the more punch lists you're going to run during the project and the more parties are going to be involved. Again, that owner may care to do a punch list, the architect may care to do a punch list, uh, and of course the subcontractor and the contractor do punch lists. Um, so with so many different parties doing punch lists, uh, utilizing a tool like Procore really simplifies things, makes it really easy on the job site, they can take their picture with their phone right there on the spot, make their punch list, and the next person walks through uh, already is updated with what the punch list is and can see it right on their phone. It makes it super easy. Some other things and some other aspects of uh, what we used to do on job sites are going away. So five, ten years ago when I used to work in the field, uh, we did transmittals for everything. Uh, we would create a transmittal anytime we gave anything anybody. And by transmittal, really all we're doing is we're tracking the who, what, when, where, and why. Who did I give it to? What did I give them? What do I want them to do with it? And, uh, and why do they have it? Um, so when we gave a subcontractor a set of drawings, for example, we would attach a transmittal that says what the drawings are and what we want them to do with it. Um, and with today's tools like Procore, you no longer need to deal with a lot of those. Um, that's all automatically tracked. When I sent the submittal out, uh, Procore already tracked who the, tran who the submittal went to, when they got it, why they got it, what we want them to do with it, uh, all at one time. And we can even track when they download the documents. Uh, it's very powerful and it removes a lot of that manual need to make transmittals every time you do anything. Uh, but that said, we still handle transmittals whenever we do hard copies. So perhaps at the end of a job when you turn over uh, O&M manual, stuff like that to the owner, you'd most likely do a transmittal to say what was given. Uh, and so you certainly would still be creating those. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of other things and a lot of other areas on a job site. Uh, where Procore can really provide a lot of value. So we take care of your drawings, put them on a mobile device, pull them up in the field. Uh, crazy, funny story. Uh, I was on a job site several years ago, and we had a uh, project engineer that came on the job site with an, one of the very first iPads. And he was all excited, and he was super techy, and he was all excited. Uh, and he ran out, and he said, someday we're going to put our drawings on these. And we literally laughed him off the site. Yeah, you're full of it. That's never going to happen. Who the hell's going to give a superintendent a, uh, an iPad? Um, but to be honest, with today's day and age, it's here, it's now. For the cost of a superintendent being a couple hours behind or a couple days behind on a drawing, or for the cost of printing and shipping drawings, uh, you can buy a lot of iPads. So utilizing something like Procore on a job site gives you so much more accountability and the ability to have everything at your fingertips no matter where you are uh, and no matter what role you're fulfilling on that job site.